Good morning. Glad to see all of you and uh, starting a brand new year. Uh, I do appreciate seeing myself on my family on the uh, prayer list. Hopefully I'm about to get off that list. Uh, last time when uh, we were together, um, I didn't know it for sure and didn't mention it. So uh, you may have noticed that I was sitting while I was uh, doing the lesson, but uh, I had the confirmation later that day that uh, the family had COVID, including me. So I was a little less full of energy than I might have been normally. And fortunately, we had a very mild case and we're over that now and uh, moving forward and uh, hopefully won't find something else to be able to, uh, uh, to take on from that. But we appreciate the prayers along the way and we're very thankful for uh, how they've impacted and, uh, and brought us back to uh, what we think is pretty close to full health. Friday, we began a new year. Now, we will not think fondly of 2020, nor will we miss it. But 2021 is a new year. And that brings with it the hope of something better, both in the world and in us. Perhaps you are one of those who declares resolutions in preparation for the coming year. Most of those resolutions are about fixing what we see as imperfections in ourselves, like weight loss or breaking bad habits in hopes that we will improve that imperfection by taking action in the next year, even with trivial things. Perhaps you express sentiments something like these for most years. My resolution this year is to stop procrastinating. But you know, it's a holiday. I'll start next week. Or I will floss every day. And not just with wild abandon in the week leading up to a clean. Or maybe you were more concerned about others and wanted to wish better things for them. So you said, this year, may your hair and teeth, your facelift, abs and stocks not fall. May your blood pressure, your cholesterol, white blood counts and mortgage interest not rise. Happy New Year. But 2020 wasn't a normal year. It was one where what we look to improve with 2021 wasn't so much ourselves, as it was the year and the situation around us. Perhaps you don't normally even stay up to see the new year in, but this time you declared, I'm gonna stay up late this New Year's Eve, not to ring in the new year, but to make sure this one leaves. Rather than making resolutions for how we might improve, most of us merely wish for the coming year to be a major improvement on what we experienced with 2020, at least the part from March until December 31st. Better yet, maybe you took a more optimistic view of the year ahead and made your New Year's resolution along the lines of, my goal in 2021 is to be filthy rich. Rich spiritually, rich in adventure, rich in health, rich in knowledge, rich in laughter, rich in family, and rich in love. 2020 was unarguably a difficult year on so many fronts and difficulty can be a challenge for anyone, even for a Christian. But we know that God never promised us a life without challenges. He did promise us a better life beyond today's challenges. And he knows that we grow from having challenges. As we say goodbye to 2020, and we look forward with anticipation to 2021, we can turn to scripture to be our guide and our encourager. We must start with facing the reality that God never promised his people that they would live life without facing significant challenges. In fact, he often has been the source and declarer of those challenges, whether they were the result of his people's transgressions or merely part of his plan or just life in the world he created for us. Perhaps the only time that man wasn't faced with challenges was in the Garden of Eden before man sinned. Because after that sin, God told woman in Genesis 3.16, to the woman he said, I will greatly multiply your sorrow and your conception. In pain, you shall bring forth children. Your desire shall be for your husband, and he shall rule over you. In turn, he told Adam in verses 17 through 19, and Adam, he said, because you have heeded the voice of your wife and have eaten from the tree of which I commanded you, saying, you shall not eat of it. Cursed is the ground for your sake. In toil, you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Both thorns and thistles shall bring forth for you, and you shall eat the herb of the field. In the sweat of your face you shall eat bread till you return to the ground. For out of it you were taken, for dust you are, 
and to dust you shall return. Sin particularly brought challenges to man, whether it was a personal sin or transgression, like Cain killing Abel, or one committed by the larger community, like the sin that preceded the great flood. Moses tells us about what preceded God's bringing about the flood and only saving a very small number of people and animals. In Genesis chapter 6, we'll look at verse 3 and then go down to verses 17 and 18. And the Lord said, My spirit shall not strive with man forever, for he indeed is flesh. Yet his days shall be 120 years. And behold, I myself am bringing floodwaters on the earth to destroy from under heaven all flesh in which is the breath of life. Everything on the earth shall die. But I will establish my covenant with you, and you shall go into the ark, you, your sons, your wife, and your son's wives with you. Earlier, Moses wrote that God saw man's wickedness and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. Only Noah found favor with God and prevented God from wiping out mankind completely. But I doubt that the many years Noah spent building a boat and preaching futilely to the people around him seemed to be anything short of hard, unappreciated work. And being trapped in an ark with so many animals, knowing everyone outside the eight people in the ark were now dead, and wondering what the future held, could not have been anything more than a huge challenge. Then there were challenges that were the result of God's greater plan as it involved even other nations. Challenges that didn't just suddenly appear, but that God even foretold before they came to fruition. Perhaps one of the most significant in this category was the bondage in which the Israelites found themselves in Egypt after being welcomed back to make it their home originally. God promised Abram, later Abraham, some terrific things, but he also made it clear that they didn't come without challenges. Moses recorded in Genesis 15, 12 through 16. Now when the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell upon Abram, and behold, horror and great darkness fell upon him. Then he said to Abraham, know certainly that your descendants will be strangers in a land that is not theirs and will serve them and they will afflict them 400 years and also the na nation whom they serve, I will judge. Afterward, they shall come out with great possessions. Now, as for you, you shall go to your fathers in peace. You shall be buried at a good old age, but in the fourth generation, they shall return here for the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet complete. What kind of a promise of a land of milk and honey with great possessions given to them by the Egyptians would come with the reality that it also meant being made servants and afflicted for 400 years? And why did the Israelites have to wait for the fourth generation to return to what was the promised land? Was it a great sin on their part? A horrible sin by one of their leaders? No. It was to allow the sin of the natives of the land to reach its completeness. That is, to the point where God felt fully justified in telling Israel to completely wipe out the Amorites and other inhabitants from the face of the earth. Do you think that made the difficulties in Egypt more tolerable to those who lived and died in that 400 period? Only as they wished for a better life for their children, as do all parents. It was a hard life. And even a distant promise of great things did not improve the conditions. Yet even in that difficult time, God's people prospered. Why did the Egyptians treat them so badly? Moses tells us in Exodus 1, verses 8 through 14. Now there arose in a new king over Egypt who did not know Joseph. And he said to his people, look, the people of the children of Israel are more and mightier than we. Come, let us deal shrewdly with them lest they multiply, and it happen in the event of war, that they also join our enemies and fight against us, and so go up out of the land. Therefore, they set tax masters over them to afflict them with burdens, and they built for Pharaoh supply cities, Pithom and Ramses. But the more that they afflicted them, the more they multiplied and grew, and they were in dread of the children of Israel. So the Egyptians made the children of Israel serve with rigor, and they made their lives bitter with hard bondage, in mortar, in brick, and in all manner of service in the field. 
All their service in which they made them serve was with rigor. The result of Egyptians making the Israelites serve them with rigor was that they multiplied and grew even faster. We know they followed up this treatment with trying to get the Israelite midwives to kill all male children at birth and ultimately requiring the Egyptians to throw them into the river. Even in difficulty, God blessed his people. Some people did great things in the name of God and benefited others. Yet they still found themselves challenged to the point of having their life in danger. David was able to soothe King Saul's troubled spirit by a song. He stood up to the Goliath when no one else would, and he did everything he was asked in serving his king, even when he had himself been anointed as the next king. But where did he find himself? He found himself pursued by Saul to be killed. Saul's own son, Jonathan, confirmed Saul's intentions when David did not attend the meals related to the new moon. Samuel writes in 1 Samuel 20, verses 27 through 33. And it happened the next day, the second day of the month, that David's place was empty. And Saul said to Jonathan, his son, why is the son of Jesse not come to eat either yesterday or today? So Jonathan answered Saul, David earnestly asked permission of me to go to Bethlehem. And he said, please let me go for our family has a sacrifice in the city and my brother has commanded me to be there. And now if I have found favor in your eyes, please let me get away and see my brothers. Therefore, he has not come to the king's table. Then Saul's anger was aroused against Jonathan, and he said to him, You son of a perverse, rebellious woman, do I not know that you have chosen the son of Jesse to your own shame and to the shame of your mother's nakedness? For as long as the son of Jesse lives on the earth, you shall not be established, nor your kingdom. Now, therefore, send and bring him to me, for he shall surely die. And Jonathan answered Saul, his father, and said to him, Why should he be killed? What has he done? Then Saul cast a spear at him to kill him, by which Jonathan knew that it was determined by his father to kill David. It wasn't just enough for Saul to say it, but his hatred for his most loyal subject was so deep that he attempted to kill his own son. Anyone who seemed to support David was a target for Saul's wrath. God's selection to be king was running for his life, and his commitment to God didn't allow him to take action to end the life of his adversary. During this challenging time, David reached out to God, as recorded in several Psalms, including the 59th, where we can hear his plea in verses 1 through 4. Deliver me from my enemies, O my God. Defend me from those who rise against me. Deliver me from the workers of iniquity. And save me from bloodthirsty men. For look, they in lie and wait for my life. The mighty gather against me. Not for my transgression, not for my sin, O Lord. They run and prepare themselves through no fault of mine. Awake to help me, and behold, through all of that, David stayed true to God, and God stayed true to him, including him becoming king, as God had declared. God's people were also put into challenging situations, based often on their disobedience and lack of trusting in God alone. For example, the tribe of Judah found themselves in Babylonian captivity after a series of their kings who did great evil in God's sight. And the nation itself forsook God, instead turning to idols. First, 10,000 were taken. But the next king, Zedekiah, foolishly rebelled. And then Jerusalem was besieged to the point where there was no food left for those remaining within it. The king tried to flee, but was caught saw his sons put to death and had his eyes put out. Everything of value was taken from the temple. It and all the houses were burned and the walls of the city were completely broken down. The rest of the people were taken captive except for the poor who were left to be vine dressers and farmers. All this had been prophesied by Isaiah years earlier as recorded in Isaiah 39, five through eight. And Isaiah said to Hezekiah, Hear the word of the Lord of hosts. Behold, the days are coming when all that is in your house and what your fathers have accumulated until this day shall be carried to Babylon. Nothing shall be left, says the Lord. And they shall take away some of your sons who will descend from you, whom you will beget. And they shall be eunuchs in the palace of the king of Babylon. So Hezekiah said to Isaiah, the word of the Lord which you have spoken is good. For he said, 
at least there will be peace and truth in my days. God still gave the opportunity for Judah to return to its good graces, as he had Jeremiah record in Jeremiah 7, verses 3 through 7. Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, amend your ways and your doings, and I will cause you to dwell in this place. Do not trust in these lying words saying the temple of the lord the temple of the lord the temple of the lord of these for if you thoroughly amend your ways and your doings if you thoroughly execute judgment between a man and his neighbor if you do not oppress the stranger the fatherless and the widow and do not shed innocent blood in this place or walk after other gods to your hurt then i will cause you to dwell in this place in the land that i gave your fathers forever and ever each of these challenges to god's people is certainly different from what we faced in 2020. But the point is that God either allows or actively challenges his people. Much of those challenges are like those of 2020, are not unique to us. Jesus tells us in Matthew 5, verses 44 through 45. But I say to you, love your enemies, bless those who curse you, do good for those who hate you, and pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you, that you may be sons of your Father in heaven. For... He makes his son to rise in the evil and on the good and sends rain on the just and on unjust. Just as good comes to both the evil and the just as represented by the rising sun, bad comes to both the evil and the just as represented by the rain. The difference with the bad is that the just, God's people, are built to withstand it, as explained in the parable Jesus told in Luke 6, 47. 48. Whoever comes to me and hears my sayings and does them, I will show you whom he is like. He is like a man building a house who dug deep and laid the foundation on the rock. And when the flood arose, the stream beat vehemently against that house and could not shake it, for it was founded on the rock. We persevere because we know that God has promised us a better life beyond what Ever challenges may face us. God's proven that time and time again. Noah persevered through the preparation for the flood, the event itself, and the aftermath, because he knew God would be with him and his family. Abram may have been a little put off by the idea that his descendants would spend 400 years in servitude, but God's promises of great things for the future overwhelmed any negative thoughts. Just consider God's promises to him in Genesis 17, the first eight verses. When Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to Abram and said to him, I am almighty God, walk before me and be blameless. And I will make my covenant between me and you and will multiply you exceedingly. Then Abram fell on his face and God talked with him saying, as for me, behold, my covenant is with you and you shall be the father of many nations. No longer shall your name be called Abram, but your name shall be Abraham, for I have made you a father of many nations. I will make you exceedingly fruitful, and I will make nations of you, and kings shall come from you, and I will establish my covenant between me and you and your descendants after you and their generations for an everlasting covenant to God, to be God to you and your descendants after you. Also, I give to you and your descendants after you the land in which you are a stranger, all the land of Canaan, as an everlasting possession, and I will be their God. David faced trouble, even though he was both loyal to Saul and to God. He had his doubts along the way, but he knew before he had even met Saul that his own destiny was to replace him as king. He wasn't Samuel's choice to be the next king, but he was God's, as Samuel records in 1 Samuel chapter 16, we'll look at verse 1, and followed by verses 6 through 7, and then 11 through 13. Now the Lord said to Samuel, How long will you mourn for Saul, seeing I have rejected him for reigning over Israel? Fill your horn with oil and go. I am sending you to Jesse, the Bethlehemite, for I have provided myself a king among his sons. Moving on to 6 through 7. So it was when they came that he looked at Elib and said, Surely the Lord's anointed is before him. But the Lord said to Samuel, Do not look at his appearance or the height of his stature, because I have refused him. 
For the Lord does not see as man sees. For man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. And later, and Samuel said to Jesse, are all the young men here? Then he said, there remains yet the youngest. And there he is keeping the sheep. And Samuel said to Jesse, send and bring him, for we will not sit down till he comes here. So he sent and brought him in. Now he was ruddy, with bright eyes and good looking. And the Lord said, arise, anoint him, for this is the one. Then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the midst of his brothers. And the spirit of the Lord came upon David from that day forward. So Samuel rose and went wrong. David was a man after God's own heart. Yet God let him be a fugitive in fear of his life. But once Saul had died, David found himself to be a powerful and rich king, blessed by God, rather, being, rather than being the shepherd Samuel first met. For all the evil that Judah and its kings had committed against God, they had a promise of being brought back from captivity, as the prophet Jeremiah recorded. In Jeremiah chapter 29, verses 10 through 14. For thus says the Lord, after 70 years are completed at Babylon, I will visit you and perform my good word to you and cause you to return to this place. For I know the thoughts that I think toward you, says the Lord, thoughts of peace, and not of evil, to give you a future and a hope. Then you will call upon me and go and pray to me, and I will listen to you. And you will seek me and find me when you search for me with all your heart. And I will be found by you, says the Lord. And I will bring you back from your captivity. I will gather you from all the nations and from all the places where I've driven you, says the Lord. And I will bring you to the place from which I cause you to be carried away. Captive. God had a plan. He had good thoughts that he thought of his people. And he was ready to give them the hope and the future that he planned for them. For the Christian, trials and tribulations are just part of the pathway we have chosen to walk. Paul and Barnabas made this clear to several churches, as Luke records in Acts chapter 14, verses 21 and 22. And when they had preached the gospel to that city and made many disciples, they returned to Lystra, Iconium, and Antioch, strengthening the souls of the disciples, exhorting them to continue in the faith and saying, we must go through many tribulations to enter the kingdom of God. Paul and those with him lived in ways that none of us will ever be faced in our Christian walk. Most of us will only suffer as others around us might suffer, and not specifically because of our faith. But that wasn't true of Paul and those of the first century church. He tells the church in Corinth in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 4 through 10, but in all things, commend ourselves as ministers of God. In much patience, in tribulations, in needs, in distresses, in stripes, in imprisonments, in tumults, in labors, in sleeplessness, in fastings. By purity, by knowledge, by long suffering, by kindness, by the Holy Spirit, by sincere love, by the word of the truth, by the power of God, by the armor of righteousness on the right hand and on the left, by honor and dishonor, by evil report and good report as deceivers and yet true, as unknown and yet well known, as dying and behold we live, as chastened and yet not killed, as sorrowful yet always rejoicing, as poor yet making many rich, as having nothing and yet possessing all things. We, like Paul and others, persevere through our challenges, whatever they may be, because we know that what awaits those who remain faithful throughout our time on earth is so worth it. The writer of Hebrews records in chapter 10, verses 32 through 34, but recall the former days in which, after you were illuminated, illuminated, you endured a great struggle with sufferings, partly while you were made a spectacle both by reproaches and tribulations, and partly while you become companions of those who were so treated. For you had compassion on me in my chains and joyfully accepted the plundering of your goods knowing that you have a better and an enduring possession for yourselves in heaven. Not only should we persevere because of what we know awaits us eternally in heaven, but because we understand that such challenges can serve a purpose in our growth as Christians. We learn very little from things going well. 
But in times of difficult, when we are required to work and to do things we may never have done before, then we learn, we grow. It is where we learn that we need to lean on others and to draw more out of ourselves than we may have ever thought we had within us. Some think Jesus promised us a life of only good here on earth. Through a misinterpretation of his purpose as our shepherd that we find in John chapter 10, verse 10. The thief does not come except to steal and to kill and to destroy. I have come that they may have life and that they may have it more abundantly. It isn't the prosperity gospel that so many in the world want to push and believe, but it's about more areas of abundance than physical possession. I think a major part of realizing the abundant life here on this earth comes from accomplishing personal growth that is not a result of what we initially perceive as good, but what brings about good and growth as an ultimate outcome. James told his readers in James chapter 1, verses 2 through 4, My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. But let patience have its perfect work, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. Wow. Is that a challenge or what? Count it nothing but joy when you fall into trials. That's hard. But he tells them why. Because that testing of your personal faith in God produces patience, which can lead to where we can see ourselves as lacking nothing. Though we may desire more, we are content as we await God's providing of it. I know that I'm not there yet in having that level of patience. And I fully expect that God will continue to provide me with challenges and trials so that my faith can produce it. Peter says that such trials are a testing of our faith, much like the process that gold goes through to be refined, become pure. And he specifically spoke to Christians like us who love and believe in a Savior that we have not seen, unlike Peter and others of the first century. He specifically spoke of that in his first epistle, 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 6 through 9. In this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while, if need be, you have been grieved by various trials. But the genuineness of your faith, being much more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to praise, honor, and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ, whom, in, whom having not seen, you love, though now you do not see him, yet believing, you rejoice with joy inexpressible and full of glory receiving the end of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Such testing results in a faith that is more precious than gold, and that is found to produce praise, honor, and glory in Jesus, whom we rejoice over, and through whom we receive the reward for such faith, salvation in him. What greater reward is there than an eternity in a place that human words cannot adequately describe with our Father, and our elder brother. Paul brings us back to focusing on the natural progression of successfully passing through tribulations in Romans chapter 5, verses 3 through 5. And not only that, but we also glory in tribulations, knowing that tribulation produces perseverance, and perseverance, character, and character, hope. Now, hope does not disappoint. Because the love of God has been poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit who was given to us. Wow. Glory in tribulations. Why? Because we gain perseverance, character, and then hope. Hope for a realized salvation. Paul hints that often we find disappointment in hope. Because it's not realized, the hope of this world. But this hope will never disappoint us because the love of God is ours through the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. That hope drove Paul to live the life that he did through all the longest of trials that he faced once God turned his life around on the road to Damascus. He told Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 7 through 8, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Finally, there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give to me on that day. 
and not to me only, but also to all who have loved his appearing. What a tremendous feeling Paul must have had writing the words about his fight and his race. Fights are not easy and are not without their physical toll on the person. The same, though in different ways, can be said above running a race. Yet Paul confidently affirmed his success and completion and his keeping his faith throughout to where he could boldly say that he had a crown of righteousness awaiting him on judgment day that all believers would also receive. Paul had earlier in 1 Timothy 6, 12, encouraged Timothy to fight that same fight of faith in order to receive the same ultimate prize of eternal life with God. Fight the good fight, faith, fight of faith. Lay hold on eternal life to which you are also called and then confess the good confession in the presence of many witnesses. That encouragement to Timothy is there as an encouragement to each of us to continue to fight the good fight, even in face of the trials that we experienced in 2020. Gain through challenges, through difficulties, through trials. Though we were never promised a life without trials as Christians, we are promised a better life beyond those challenges with growth and an abundant life, even as we pass through this life to get to our reward of heaven. COVID-19 wreaked havoc on our lives in 2020 in many different ways. It has challenged us as people, as Christians, and as a church. Social unrest has tried to divide us further in an effort to, um, to address mistreatments. God's church, you, needs to keep its eyes on the prize and live the life we're called to live. It isn't a promise of no suffering, no loss, and no difficulty, but it is a promise that it is worth whatever we must go through in getting to our true home in heaven. 2021 isn't guaranteed to return us to what we saw as normal or to make all the challenges of 2020 go away. But we can make it better for us than 2020, no matter what changes or doesn't around us. Each year is an opportunity, just as each day, each hour, and each minute provide us another chance to do right by God. For all that 2020 may have cost us, we had an opportunity, perhaps even an encouragement, to focus on the most valuable things, God and family. 2020 offered you the opportunity to capitalize more on both of them. Did you? Will you in 2021? Did you pray more? Did you read the scriptures more? Did you encourage others more? Did you grow as a Christian? If you didn't, then 2021 is your opportunity to change that. If you did, then carry on with the good fight, always looking for ways to do even better than you have in the past. Understand that life isn't just easy street, but God knows where it is taking us. My mother's favorite, favorite poet was Helen Steiner Rice, and I tried to give her several cards for the years with some of the poet's verses. One of those poems is called Bend in the Road. Sometimes we come to life's crossroads and we view what we think at the end. But God has a much wider vision and he knows that it's only a bend. The road will go on and get smoother. And after we stop for a rest, the path that lies beyond us is often the path that is best. So rest and relax and grow stronger. Let go and let God share your load and have faith in a brighter tomorrow. You've just come to a bend in the road. If that bend in the road that was 2020 caused you to fall away from your faith, I encourage you to use today, use 2021 to fix your relationship with God privately or through contact with your elders. If you're not even on God's pathway, then I encourage you to fix that by action. Get with one of the elders and come up with a plan where you can confess Jesus as a son of God, repent of your sinful life, be baptized, and begin the Christian walk. Wherever we find ourselves, let's all commit to making 2021 a year of rejoicing, a year of fighting the good fight, a year of focus on God, a year of growth as Christians, and not a year of fear nor dread. Think on this as we sing this next song and as we go through this week.